Good morning. Because this is our first worship service of 2021, um, perhaps this is fitting for the new year. Richard Foster, a theologian, a former professor at George Fox University, and who is about my age, offers this quotation regarding a life of worship. Cause every task of your day to be sacred ministry to the Lord, however mundane your duties. For you, they are a sacrament. One member of our church family, who is no doubt going to be watching the video of today's service, has stated, there is no such thing as a coincidence. As well, there are no inconsequential activities. When, when we live lives of worship, every activity becomes infused with significance. For example, ironing, or trans, transporting a busload of teenagers across the state of Idaho. Um, we turn our daily activities into worship as we offer them to the Lord. A life of worship is your chance to thank our Lord for taking care of all the details of your life. And then I ran across the lyrics of, of this song. I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to read the lyrics. How can I praise if I cannot sing? What do I give the God who made everything? How can I fill my days with hallelujahs in my hands? What are the greatest of commands? Matthew 22, 37 through 38, sum up what a life of worship is all about. You must love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And this is my prayer. Father, help us to remember that there is always something worthy of our worshiping you, both in good times and bad. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's all stand and sing uh, hymn number, and we don't have the overhead, so uh, we need to sing out of the hymnals. Hymn number 218 in the blue one. Hands with gladness, men of old, guiding star behold. As with joy they Leading onward beaming bright So most gracious Evermore be led to thee Verse 2 As with joyful <clears throat> Savior to the lowly bed adore so may we with ever seek thy mercy seed and verse 5 in the heavenly need they no created light thou its light its crown thou its sun which goes not down there forever may we sing to our King. And number 1045 in the supplement, and that's We Three Kings. And I like this because the first verse of the one we just sang refers to the star that we followed. 
10, uh, 45. Okay, let's see. Am I lost here? 47. Here we go. 1, 2, and 5. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we travel so far. sister want to come up for a children's story today? Come on up. Brittany has a story. She prepared. We don't want to just have her and her kids up here, so come on up.
mysteries and trails that lead me to food. That's always good. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Sherry. And a special thank you to... Um, now, Brittany's done these before, but a special thank you to, to Sherry uh, for being our worship leader today. And, and I don't know if you can all fathom this, but this was the very first time that she's done the worship leader here, as long as they have been a part of this church. And so, thank you, Sherry. She stepped out of her comfort zone to help us out today. Well done. Um, as we get started, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, we know we're a little few in numbers uh, today. Um, earlier service at 8.30, there were five of us. And uh, we just had a little conversation, had read some scripture and had prayer. And that was our time this morning, which uh, as someone had mentioned, it's things don't happen by accident or, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. So there was a reason why we had a small group there this morning, but we had... Um, an important time together, so it was good. And it's important, and I'm glad each of us are here, um, even though we're few in numbers as well. Just a few little things before I read the scripture. Please keep John and Tasha. That's the reason why I'm up here again. You have to suffer through another one of me again, but um, they're, they're recovering, and the last I heard, uh, improving, I think, is what I, that we heard. So John was feeling better yesterday. Um, so that's, that's good. Also keep Dale uh, in your prayers as well, Dale Welsh. Um, I think he's been ill, so keep him in your prayers. I will read a, a passage. You'll hear two different versions of this one. I'll read uh, one from uh, the New King James Version. This is Romans, uh, and then Amber will come and, and read some from Job uh, this morning. So this is from Romans Chapter 12, 9 through 21, from the New King Version, New King James Version. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to, uh, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give a place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry... Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be come, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.
This far, you may come no further. Here is where your proud ways halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it may, might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a heel. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Thank you, Amber. And it was a kind of a Interesting week, how we got to this point today, not knowing for sure that uh, we would have service again. And I thank Sherry for, and the committee to help and all who involved Stacy just try to get things planned for today. And I think Amber and Brittany and Sherry and, and others, Mark, for just being here and being a part and helping out uh, in some way today. So we thank everyone for making today possible, kind of on shorter notice uh, to cover for John. So I love that passage that uh, Amber just uh, read, and we'll talk more about Job here in just a second. I think most of us have heard the expression, just give me the nuts and bolts of it, or here is the nuts and bolts of the situation. In other words, what is the nitty gritty, the, the brass tacks, the skinny, there's a whole list of things, you know, get down to business Uh, information of it all. What is the bottom line? What is ground zero for us? So to start today, I'd like to think, uh, talk a little bit about uh, and enlist the help of a three-year-old's mind, Brittany, who was just here, and her her oldest, Autumn. I got permission to share this little story. Uh, Earlier in the week, at prayer time, they were talking before they had prayer, um, and talking about God and all that he is. Okay, three years old, keep that in mind. And and then finally, Autumn asked her mom, well, how big is God anyway? That's a great question, isn't it? That's a great question for all of us at, at, at any age. How big is God? You know, people I think have been pondering that question for well, as long as, as we've been in existence, you know, maybe even Adam and Eve at some point were wondering, you know, how is the, how big is God? And I think as adults, we try to navigate that answer the best we can, and we try to um, put it in some kind of framework or understanding of how big God is, and Brittany probably did a fine job with, you know, explaining that to, to Autumn on, on how big God is. You know, did was her understanding, you know, brought up from that as a three-year-old? I, it's hard to know. But how, how has our understanding sometimes developed of thinking about how big God is? It did make me stop and think, though, a little bit about um, the book of Job that Amber just read. When it comes to how big God is or God's, God's power, his involvement in the universe compared to us. Don't you love some of those expressions? And if we just set that up a little bit as we talk just a tiny bit about Job in this passage, that Job had lost a lot or almost everything prior to this. He had been going through probably the most difficult uh, part of his life that he's ever gone through. Lost family members, lost possessions, property, you name it. If you read back through the book of Job, he, he, he lost a lot. And through this process, this is the quick paraphrase version, as we get up to chapter 38, you know, he has some friends that, you know, try to help him and encourage him. And uh, his wife tells him to just, you know, curse God and die and and, um, you know, just some really great stuff. But at, as he comes to this point, it seems like Job is finally kind of persuaded. And when I think about that, even so, he still has to 
buy into the eye or take the bait, so to speak. And God lets them have it. Were you there when I created? Were, were, were you, do you know where death's door is? And, just, and if you just think of these questions, uh, it is, it's amazing to think. We, we've, we've come so far in humanity and our understanding and our knowledge of things. But if God were to come and address us like he did Job, it would be a very humbling experience, wouldn't it? Very humbling. I've used this quote many, many times over the years, uh, but it's a great quote, and I, I still use it. And it's, uh, if you can explain your God, your God is too small. And that was Albert Einstein said that. If we can truly explain God, our God is too small. I think it's tricky sometimes trying to explain God. In some ways, we think it's very easy. You know, we think, well, you know, God is love. You know, maybe that kind of sums up who God is. I think that's very true. God is love. We, we, we know that. And so in some ways, it, God is easy to understand. But in other ways, as we, we learn from Job, is God is very complex, above our understanding. And in a lot of ways, in most ways, nearly impossible for us to really fathom who God is. You know, it talks about no one has seen the face of God. Jesus, of course, being uh, from heaven, being sent down, of course, knew, knows what God looks like. Then there's a story of, uh, there's a few, a few in the Bible that have come close to that point. Moses was very close when he was at the burning bush on the mountain. And the angel, you know, said, you know, God is basically arriving here uh, and... and um, let me just read that little part from Exodus to you. Exodus chapter 3. I'll just start at the beginning of that chapter, verses 1 through 6 in Moses, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro and his father-in-law, the, pre, the father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, a fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here, I'm, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That'd be enough to scare you just a little bit, wouldn't it? And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. These are just two little accounts in the stories of, of Job and Moses, uh, Moses, but we're reminded that when we seek out God, it's very serious. I mean, think about it. When we approach God in prayer, we are, we are, we are talking, we are in the presence of the sustainer of the universe. Think about that. And again, think about the scripture from Job that Amber read. Put yourself in Job's position and try to imagine God grilling you about, you think you're pretty smart? Think you know a lot of stuff? Let's talk about this. Yikes. So with that being said, when we go to pray, when we're speaking with God, we should really come with a humble very humble heart and attitude. 
Yes, we can approach the throne of God with confidence because we, because we know Jesus. And he's made the way for us, a bridge for us. However, humility, I think, is still the key, uh, a part of this. It's the same reason that, you know, we think about this. Um, sometimes we do it just as auto- automatically, you know, uh, if those of us who like to wear hats, and, and I encourage my boys, they like to wear ball caps, and then, but when we have prayer time, caps come off, right? Caps, hats come off as we pray. Or even when we, when we pray, the idea of bowing, what is that? That's the symbol of, of, of respect, reverence, and maybe even submission as we lower our head to really a God that is worthy of that. It's not that we are just coming to whoever to talk. We're coming to the God, the creator of the universe. Think about reactions uh, of, of people that have interacted with angels um, or with God in like the burning bush or with Job. What is, you can, and you can speak up today, what is usually the reaction from humans when this happens? Fear, scared to death, right? Why, why, why wouldn't we? You know, we think, oh, we don't want to be afraid of God, but... But in a lot of ways, we need to be afraid in the sense of, of we are talking to the creator of the universe. Yes, God is love. But God is also many other things as well. And that's what makes God a little bit complicated, I think, for us at times. He's the sustainer of life and the world that we live in. And just think about that, you know, If God were to pull back his life, his breath, then that's the end, right? Think back to the story in in, uh, Genesis. Um, Right right around the time of, of Noah and him wiping everybody out, there's passages of scripture there where it says God was sorry that he had made man. I mean, I think to that passage, that, that is a very powerful comment. You know, like, I'm sorry, you guys have messed it up so bad, maybe I shouldn't have gone on this adventure with humans, right? But what do we have is the love story that God did. He wanted the reconciliation. He wanted us to be a part of this. The other part about God, I think, is we, we think of sustainer of life, and God is also uh, the one and only judge. Now this area we usually don't want to go to very much because how many of us like to be called on the carpet or be in, in judgment? Um, you know, we don't want to be told the things that we've done wrong um, typically or we just want to hear the good, you know, the good stuff um, of, of what we do. But you know, the Bible reminds us also that uh, at one, one point in time, we will all be held accountable for our actions, good and bad. And there'll be no hiding anything that we've ever done in the presence of God. So as we've gone this far and kind of in this direction, and we'll get into Romans here in just a minute, but try as we might, and we might be trying really hard, we'll never earn our way to heaven. You know, John's done a wonderful job about preaching and telling us, you know, how important grace is. You know, we, we can't do this on our own. We can't get to heaven. We can't be with the Lord by just doing good things and being a good person. You know, one of the main defenses of that statement, if, you know, if we hear uh, about just being good, is that, well, why would God need to send his son then to live and to die, and to be raised again if we could just be good enough on our own to get to heaven. There would be no need for that. You know, many of us have heard, heard this, this statement or comment, oh, they were such a good person, they must have gone to heaven. It's not our place to judge. 
in any shape or form because we just don't, we just can't do that. Well, we do, but we shouldn't because we don't have all of the information like God does. But what is clear, that what God tells us is that for, God's, for he so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was born, he lived, he died, he was raised again uh, to, to be in place, to take the place of our sin. And I think the part that we remember that, that's, that's important for us to remember through all of this is God cannot be in the presence of sin or evil or anything unpure. That's why we have the bridge of Jesus uh, in order for us to go to heaven. And Jesus is our bridge, or the plain and simple. And I think of uh, the, the, the title, uh, that's the nuts and bolts of that. We, we need the Lord. We need to have him in our hearts. So Job again for just a minute. Job was doing pretty good. He, he was a, a God-fearing person. He respected God, what happened. Um, but what happened for God to start verbally basically spanking him? His, fr his friends persuaded him to kind of be puffed up and proudful of, yeah, you really should ask God why all this happened because you're such a great person. You must have done something wrong. Pride before the fall. When we decide that we are smart enough, wise enough, good enough to question God, start looking at some of the Bible accounts. It doesn't usually go well for the person who puts themselves in that position. God usually reminds them that of, of who he is and why he is who he is. So let's just transition now a little bit to uh, Romans. Uh, as we think about, uh, in this section of my Bible, I don't know if, if yours says the same thing, but it says, behave like a Christian. I read from the New King's Version. I like to read um, from the Message Version this passage as well. This is Romans uh, chapter 12, 9 through 21. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down and out. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be a great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. When I think about God's message to us uh, and the way that we're supposed to, to act and to be with others, this first verse here uh, in, this, or in 9 that I just read can really hit you like right between the eyes when you think about this verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. 
cling to what is good. Or in other versions, it says, let your love be genuine. Not fake, not just for funsies. It's got to be real. We know when we're real. I mean, let's be honest. When, we, when we're uh, being real with somebody or loving somebody, it, we know when we are. And I think they feel when we are genuine as well. On the flip side of that, we can feel very fake. You know, we've probably all been in those positions where someone may say that they're liking us. Maybe it's been coworkers over the years, family members somewhere down the line, old, old friends, whatever it is. We know when someone's being real with us or when someone's not being real with us. And this is where I'd say, this is kind of like the nuts and bolts of, of behaving like a Christian. When we've made that decision to give our lives to Christ, it's, it's not only the, that it gets us eternal life. Don't get, that, don't get me wrong. That, that is awesome, right? That's what we're, we're hopeful for, uh, as, especially as we get older, is that we will have an eternal life with our Lord. But when we no longer live our lives for ourselves, but for God and others, then not faking that love. Let's just go down uh, through some of these things again uh, and back to the New King James Version. Um, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving perseverance to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Verse 12 would probably be a good one for the year 2020, don't you think? Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, stead, continually steadfast in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. This next few verses are really difficult, I think, for us. And uh, as Paul reminds us, and, you know, and, and in the Beatitudes of Matthew Jesus reminds us as well. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Hmm. That one's a hard one sometimes, isn't it? Rejoice with those who rejoice. That one I think we're pretty good at. I think we, we enjoy to, to be able to rejoice with people when they're happy and things are going well. The second part of that verse, and weep with those who weep. In my house, I'm known as the resident crier. So this part of the verse is not a problem for me, right? <laughs> the weeping uh, uh, with others. Uh, but it, it just reminds us of, the, of, of situationally what we should be and, and to others and that genuine love. When they're happy, that we just, oh, that is so great that things are going well. When things are not going well, that we're, oh, you're in our prayers and you're, that we are really genuine about the love uh, about about them doing better uh, and um, just being with them in difficult times. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Job reminds us when I read chapter 38, not to be wise in our own eyes, right? Right? Repay no one evil for evil. Have a regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as such as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men or with all people. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. A lot of these fly right in the face, too, of what our culture sometimes tells us that we should do. Man, if that person does you wrong, you need to take care of it. If you want to climb the corporate ladder, it doesn't matter who you step on to get to the top. If someone steps on you, you step on them and you keep on going. That's a lot of what our culture at times tells us. So as behaving as a Christian as this chapter uh, talks about, it, has to, it points us in another direction of, of our life and how we are to live. 
If your enemy is hungry, feed them. Thirsty, give them a drink. For in doing so, I like in the, in the message version, it says, you'll surprise them with your kindness. Instead of heaping coals on their head in the, in the King, King James Version, but I, I like how they've kind of interpreted that as you're going to surprise people when you do good to them, even when they've done bad to you. This past year, 2020, um, was maybe, hopefully, may, the, a, a new great awakening for us Christians. I don't know if any of you, uh, I don't know if any but he watched uh, the uh, last Sunday's sermon on YouTube or not um, that we put up there. But one of the things I, I said in, in last week was that what if we find out 20 years from now that, that the year 2020, more people, or maybe it will be when we get to heaven, that we find out, well, you know, that remember that, that horrible year 2020 and everybody and the virus and uh, you know, all the political mess and everything that was going on and... What if we find out that more people came to Jesus in 2020 than any other period in history? Wouldn't it have been worth it? Now more than ever, the world needs us as followers of Jesus to show that we're not afraid. And that doesn't mean just not wearing a mask because we're not afraid. It means that, we're, we're, that we're, we are not afraid because we know who's in control. We know that God is helping us. We know who is our Savior. We know who has written, and we know the last part of the Bible of Revelations. Uh, we've written, we've, we've seen the last page of the book, so to speak. I think that's how Billy Graham said it. I've read the last page of the Bible. I know how things are going to turn out. So now more than ever, the world needs to see Jesus in us, in the midst of, of, of the chaos that's around us at times. That they need to see that we are followers of Jesus and that we give him all the glory for that. I think Paul spells it out for us pretty clearly, pretty basically, just the facts, the nuts and bolts of it, that we're called to a higher standard as Christians. A higher, more humble standard. Whoever is our enemy is not our position to judge, hate, or condemn them. God knows better than us, so why take on that role as judge? In verse 21, it says, Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When I thought of that verse, and, and, and it says, And who or what is good? And think about that. And only Jesus is good. So if we just put and translate in there, uh, cling to that which is good, and put Jesus in there instead of good, let's just cling. Instead of doing evil, let's just cling to Jesus. So how do we overcome evil? Of course, it's with Jesus. How do we live our lives? How do we behave like a Christian? How big is God? All these questions we sometimes rattle through our brains at times. By loving others as God loved us. And Sherry read from Matthew, and, and again, that's one of those things that her and I didn't coordinate. She had picked out her, but that was the perfect passage in there that, you know, our greatest commandment is for us to love others like God loves us. And to love God with all our heart and our soul, with all our being. And to love people with a genuine love, a true love, not a fake love. A love so powerful uh, that God had for us that he spared nothing, absolutely nothing, to have connection and to bring us into his fold that he sent his son for us. Now that's a love, and that's powerful. And that should be our path and our journey and our objective as Christians as we move, as we move along our path of life. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious, loving, 
Almighty God. You have many attributes of who you are. But we know probably the greatest of those is that you are love. In this world uh, that we are living in right now, Lord, it's difficult at times to want to just be moving along in it because we're just frustrated, oh God, with, with a lot of things. But help us to turn those frustrations over to you, to hand them all over to you at your feet. Remind us that, oh Lord, you are still on the throne. You are in charge and that you love us very much. Lord, we pray that you just be with those who couldn't be here today. Be with John and Tasha. Be with Dale and so many others that are ill. Lord, just be with our, our group in the days ahead. Lord, we pray that you will bring, be able to bring us back together uh, in this building and, and that things will start settling down. But regardless, oh God, help us just to be mindful and humble that you are our God and that you do have things in control. We thank you for this time together today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, 416 in the blue hymnal, please. Let us go forth knowing that God loves us and that is our call to duty to love others. Have a blessed day.